Um, my name is Todd Little. I'm the CEO of Lean Kanban. Uh, I've been around the Agile community for a long time. I uh, got started uh, in 2003. I uh, helped Alistair Coburn start the Agile Development Conference, which is now the, the Agile 2019 conference. Um, went through big changes. When we started, we had 230 people attending. Uh, I think now it regularly gets around 2,500. Uh, and I've been to Agile India. The, this is my fifth time. I feel very welcome here. I'm glad to see a lot of uh, familiar faces. And so today we're going to really talk about Agile Mindset. It's Agile Mindset Day, and we're going to talk about um, what that means from a Kanban perspective. What is the Kanban Mindset? So first, I'd like to talk about the Agile Mindset. Um, when you talk about the Agile Mindset, we have a whole day dedicated to Agile Mindset. What does that mean to you? What does Agile Mindset mean? Anyone? Thinking differently. Thinking differently, OK. So a psychopath is an Agile Mindset? <laughs> Could be. Why not? Okay. All right. Anything else from Agile Mindset means? Open for learning. Open for learning. OK, very good. What's that? Growth mindset. OK, that's coming from the. Um, uh, OK, adapting to what you see and, and building from that. Great. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you get an agile mindset? You take a course? Yeah. You buy a t shirt? You live it somehow? OK. Experiment? OK. Well, and it, it, this is just to start with. Um, and I've, I've um, been around in the industry for a while. And the interesting thing that I saw is that you know, before you even knew about um, Agile, uh, Agile development, I'd been in a company in the 1990s. Uh, and it was the most impressive organization. It, it was really f focused on. Um, meeting customer needs, then the environment was just energetic. It was a great place to work. And if I think back in my career, at different places I've been, um, one of the ways I like to characterize um, businesses and, and what it takes to run a business uh, is this model of people, process, technology, and then to that I add business, right? Because this people, process, and technology are there to enable the business to do something. And if I look at this from sort of how this is interconnected between these, the challenge I see, I think this is probably the biggest thing we see in the, that I've seen in the distinction between sort of doing Agile or doing Agile versus being Agile, is that a lot of Agile transformations start down at the process and technology perspective. And where I have seen the biggest impact is when you have a really clear focus of what your customers are doing, when you know your business, and you create an environment where people can be effective at delivering against the business, to me, that is where it enables an agile mindset. You've got people who are directly responsible to what's happening and delivering against what customers need. That is just an amazing, energetic place. And when we were doing that, we really didn't care that much about what our processes or technologies were. It was like water to fish. They just emerged, right? Could, if we had focused on instead processes and technologies and lost track of a business and lost track of the environment where people could do things, I think that would have been a big setback. And I've seen organizations that have claimed to be agile that don't get the top two things, and they really aren't being that effective. So why Kanban? So you know, now, now with uh, Kanban, what is it about Kanban that, that's sort of interesting in these, these days and ages? This is an interesting tidbit from the 2019 uh, Scrum Master Trends report given by, uh, done by Scrum.org. And what you see there is that organizations that are doing Scrum are now finding Kanban to also be very, a very effective tool to augment their Scrum implementations. 81% of people claim that we're also using uh, Kanban. And this has been growing. Uh, the Scrum Alliance does a similar survey, and it's been growing continually uh, over the years. So Kanban's out there. There's a lot of, you know, but I think uh, whether you're doing Scrum or, or whether you're just applying Kanban directly, 
Uh, the nice thing about Kanban is that it's an apply it to where you're at now. And Kanban can be very easily applied to Scrum, and can, it, it provides another tool in your toolkit that enables you to be agile and more, more agile, or to bring business agility. So what is the Kanban mindset? What do, what do we think of when we talk about the Kanban mindset? Before we get there, let's start with what we think, what we, what we call Kanban. So we distinguish between what people think Kanban is, and a lot of people just think Kanban is a bunch of stickies on the wall, or it's a to-do doing done column, or it's throwing things into Trello, or it's that one thing that Jira laps at the end of, of, you know, and says, oh, this is your Kanban board. Kanban does derive, does, does have a lot of visual implications, and a Kanban board is a great tool, but Kanban is far more than a visual tool. Kanban is a, is a tool for teaching organizations how to understand, visualize, and measure systems of work to continually improve and, deli and consistently deliver results. It provides a set of proven practices and approaches that scale from individuals and teams to the enterprise. It's more than just a bunch of stickies on a wall. I think how many people see Kanban is this thing under the Agile umbrella. And while that's not entirely incorrect, I think the way we see Kanban is it goes well beyond. It goes well beyond software. We have applied Kanban in many places, financial industries. I've been applying it recently in, in geosciences and oil companies, geosciences and engineers. Uh, we're applying it in HR, marketing. It's a full business cycle. It applies to anything where knowledge work is, is going on, ongoing. So it turns out a lot of the implementations of Kanban are in the IT business and in software. The Kanban expands well beyond that. It's the great unifier. It's a start with where you're at now. If you're, if you're in chaos, you can still apply, uh, start applying Kanban and continuously improving. Scrum, you could be from a CMO, my world, safe, waterfall. Wherever you're at, Kanban can start and it can provide you incremental improvements and start an evolutionary change, change process. Some of the foundations of Kanban, we start with change principles, we have service delivery principles, and then we have general practices. And all of this around some Kanban values. So let's start with the change management principles. First, start with what you do now. We don't care where you're, start, where you're at. We don't, we're not judgmental. Wherever you're at, that's great. Let's learn that. Let's understand it. Understand that current process, not as you say you do it, but as you actually do it. Because then once we understand what you're actually doing, then we can start looking at how to improve it. We respect existing roles, responsibilities, and job titles. We don't go change things, right? This is an evolutionary approach. If, if in the process we want to experiment with changing something, we do that. We design experiments. We then gain, equip, we gain um, agreement to pursue incremental to improvement through imp evolutionary change. And then we encourage acts of leadership at all levels. Oftentimes, traditional change is this A to B type process. We start with a current process. We say what we really want to be, this future state, what does that look like? And then we introduce this thing called a transformation. Very common pro process. Right? I was in an organization last week. I think they had four transformation initiatives underway at the same time. Organizations seem to love transformations. Kanban approaches this differently. Why? Well, the problem with this approach is, one, it's effectively a waterfall approach to change. Right? It's designing the future based on what you know today. It's not, discover it's not a discovery process. So it's all designed in advance, and the transformation's big bang. The other problem with the big bang is we go through pain. We go through the secure change model. We introduce the change, and the first thing, we have a big hit. Productivity actually goes down for a while. So there's safety. There's how much productivity can we afford to lose? And then there's patience. How long does it take for us to recover? And then eventually we get back, anyway, we improve and get back beyond that. But this is, a, this is a, a, a big challenge. Kanban takes an approach of evolutionary change. We start with the initial process. 
We evaluate the fitness of that process. So understand it. Is it delivering what we want? We experiment. And if that, if that experiment proves to be valuable, we start a new place. And then we evaluate that against new fitness criteria. And we continue this process. And potentially we roll back when we realize the experiment didn't quite work what it wanted. We can roll forward and continue this process of evaluating. And eventually we emerge to a new state. And this is all an evolving process. A very different than a transformational approach. It's an evolutionary approach. We're like water. A Kanban says to approach the world like water. You're going to hit resistance. Water goes around rocks. We approach going around the rocks. What's the around the rock strategy that lets us, in, that it's our gain that we want, right? Not the big, big transformation that tries to blow through the rock. The result of this is that we have incremental changes. We have smaller, uh, smaller air, uh, safety bars, or so, so it's, a fail, it's a safer to fail experiment. And we repeat these until we get to the two. And we repeat these continuously. We continue to evolve our change. It's not an end state. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. So the Kanban method is a method for improving service delivery. It's catalyzing improvements and evolving a bit the business to be fit for purpose. It is not a project management method. It is not a software development life cycle process. And this idea that Kanban is for ops, Scrum is for projects, is just not, not the case. It, this is fake news. Um, Kanban can be applied to anything that's knowledge work. Uh, I've applied it, a lot of people have applied it to software projects, uh, and of course we applied it even outside of software. Some of the service delivery principles. The way we see the world is an organization, a network of independent services, of interdependent services, and policies that determine the behavior. So it's understood that the focus is on the customer's needs. We always are, are thinking in terms of what is the customer's real need here, and then we manage the work and let workers self-organize it. Manage the work, not the workers. Regularly review the network and its policies to improve the outcomes. Always looking to outcomes, right? So what's a service? You think in terms of customer has some need. They request a product or a service. That then is the service delivery. How is that need going to be fulfilled? So that is the process that we explore. How can we, can we look at that as a flow uh, of what it is to that service? And then the need gets fulfilled. Then the Kanban lens, we look at all work as flow. How does work flow through the system? We see the workflow as a series of knowledge discovery steps. Each time in the, in the process of flow, we see knowledge discovery, and that helps us evolve it. We see knowledge work as a service, and then we see organizations as networks of service. So all throughout the organization. Then we look at the principle, or the, the practices, the six core practices of Kanban. Number one is visualize. That is the, the you know, the, the, could be the stickies on the wall. Vis visualization is a very key element of what we provide in the Kanban method. We also limit work in progress to make sure that we don't have too much ongoing at once. We stop starting and start finishing. That's because we want to manage flow. We want to keep things flowing through the system. If we keep pushing things into the system, we create bottlenecks. Instead, we want to keep a constant flow. That greatly improves our predictability. We make our policies explicit. Make sure people know how, how work is flowing through the system. We establish feedback loops. Cadences, perhaps, or means by which to provide uh, this whole element of feedback loop is, is the essence of the learning. And through the learning, we can evolve and improve. And we improve collaboratively and evolve experimentally. So together, we look at what, where we're at, and we continue to look, how could we get better? What, could, what did we learn from the system? What did we learn from yesterday? What did we learn from the day before? How can we improve 
and continuously look to evolve our systems. So let's put that in a picture here. Since we like visualize, this is a visual map. We've got ideas coming in. Our ideas are coming in. These are, we're filtering these through, and some things we're gonna, gonna uh, say are not economic. We don't want to uh, overload the system. But we're flowing ideas all the way from the beginning, from the customer possibility, to the end game of the, what's the present? What's the, what's the value to the customer at the end? So demand comes in, it's fed through to outcome. So we want to visualize that. We do that. The next step is to understand the system. What are we doing today? We go through a detailed process to try to understand what are we doing today and lay it out. That process is called static, systems thinking approach to introducing Kanban. So we identify services, and for each service, we try to understand what makes this surface service fit for purpose. How is it working in the to deliver on the customer's needs? Then we want to look at what are the sources of dissatisfaction regarding our current delivery. Where is the upset? How is the customer? And then we're looking both externally and internally. How is the customer dissatisfied today? And how is the team and the delivery model dissatisfied? Where are all the stakeholders that are dissatisfied? Let's understand all of that because that source of dissatisfaction is very telling. We then want to understand and analyze the sources and nature of demand. The demand for this service, how frequently is it? Where is it coming from? Who is it coming from? We want to compare that to our current capacity, our current, our current ability to deliver. We then want to model the service delivery workflow. How is the series of steps, the knowledge discovery steps? How does that look like? What is the flow of the work? Are there classes of service? Do we have some work which we teach differently than other, other work? And through this process, we define the Kanban system. And that, could, that will be our existing system. We define that, and then what we do is continually iterate that and design experiments to get better. What we believe in the Kanban world is that in order to continuously improve our system, we need to understand it. So we put a lot of effort into understanding the system and designing it so that we then can do the effort to, to actually start looking to how to improve it. So once we've understood the system, what are we looking? We're really focused on flow. Flow is a key element of Kanban. It's all about making, making um, work flow through the system. We always ask ourselves, what's blocking this? How can we improve flow? How can we get more things out the door rather than pull, pushing things in the door? We want to balance capacity and demand. We have tools that allow us to do that because if we balance capacity and demand, then flow will continue. We limit WIP as another means to control flow. And we look at bottlenecks to see what can we do to de-bottleneck the system so that flow is even better. Then we're looking at scaling up. So as we're scaling up, this is Kanban flight levels from Klaus Leopold. We've got an operational team level. We've got coordination flight levels. And then we have strategic flight levels. This is to say Kanban is scaling up and we can connect these through, through interdependent uh, network of services. So then what we're looking at is how do we improve? Kanban heavily relies on metrics. What are the metrics of the system telling us? We use this to help us incrementally uh, improve our process. The other thing we do is to feedback loops from the product side, from what we're delivering. As we feed back that back through, so every time we're, we're creating double loop learning here, learning how to improve our process, learning how to improve our products and services. So if we look at sort of where, what does it mean from the Kanban mindset? What are some of the things we're really, really emphasizing? What is it to me? What do I, I take away from it? And I think we brought it up, someone brought it up earlier. A huge part of it is learning and evolutionary change. We want to learn and we want to continuously improve. It's a framework for continuously improving and evolutionary change. We focus on flow, we focus on visualization. These are tools that all enable us to really drive a continuous improvement mindset. 
A little bit about the, where, what's available in the Kanban world. Uh, I know that uh, South India skiing is not all that big of a thing. But uh, we try to get people to, to higher levels of proficiency in Kanban. So this is the different levels from a team Kanban, team Kanban level just to be able to get started um, down through a Kanban management professional, uh, and an advanced Kanban management professional, and then to the highest level Kanban coach where you're really able to go in and we're teaching the, the, the core principles of Kanban in order to um, start from first principles to get the most com complex coaching situations addressed. We've recently come out with the Kanban maturity model. Uh, and the Kanban maturity model, the idea of the Kanban maturity model is, has some basis in things like the, the, the capability maturity model. But one, there's a, key, a couple of key elements that are very different. And I think I'll put it down in that, that, that spot that's in red. We're really focused on observable business outcomes. We're focused on the outcomes, not practices. We don't use the Kanban maturity model as a checklist. We're looking for what observable outcomes are you looking to improve? And we see this as a bit of a playbook of things that we've observed over many years of practices that, that and, and challenges that organizations have. There's two particular challenges organizations that we've seen. One is where they try to jump too hard. They jump too far ahead. They overreach. So they're really in a very low maturity and they try to take on, on um, uh, solving a problem which is made way too hard for them. So that's overreaching. The other one is where they make a few changes and they feel, oh, we're doing great because we made a few changes, but they've really plateaued. And they really, the whole thing with Kanban is we can take them even further. We can evolutionary change continuously and we can and, and take them on to higher and higher levels to points where they'd be fitter, for, for, fitter and fitter for purpose with their business. Um, just a little bit, uh, we have a conference uh, coming up in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, a number of different reports from organizations. These are the types of organizations that are using Kanban. Uh, there's also the Lean Kanban India coming up in August 20, uh, t second through third uh, here. And then uh, it's not too late. I do have a workshop coming up on this weekend for the Kanban maturity or Kanban uh, uh, management professional. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions. This is really just an introduction. Trying to hit sort of the highlights of Kanban and some of the things that the Kanban uh, mindset means. And I'd love, love any sort of questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, hi, Todd. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the session. So basically, very basic question right now. A lot of people actually face this issue to go for Kanban or go for Scrum, right? What is that? A uh, lot of people, when they try to go for project implementation, they will have a challenge of selecting Kanban approach or probably Scrum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basic in terms of, you know, what are the differentiation? Should we go with this or should we go with that, right? So can you just give your overview on that? Yeah, so I don't, I don't see it as a Kanban or Scrum approach, right? I, I think that there are great things in Scrum, and Scrum is an excellent tool in a lot of environments, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, I think also Scrum is a place, we, we have this model of start where you're at. If you've already made a Scrum transformation and you want to continue to experiment with things, there's a number of Kanban approaches that you can apply in a Scrum world and get significant impro you know, continuous improvement from that point on. So um, I think the, the nature is that, that we approach things from, from Kanban is wherever you're at, you can start with Kanban. That's the nice thing about it. And so you don't have to make any big change. You, you don't have to make big transformational changes. You just have to put the effort in to understand your system as it is. So I guess I, I look at it as a, it's a different type of question, right? It's, it's, uh, but, but I don't want to say there's anything, I mean, if you're finding Scrum is working for you, that's great. You know, use, use Scrum and, and work with it. Um, and I've worked with other organizations, but I'll, I'll coach the Scrum uh, coaches to, to understand. Understand enough about Kanban so that when you want to use some of the tools that are available in it and some of the different things, the different mindset elements of, of Kanban, they're available to you. 
Right. Don't limit yourself. Thanks. Uh, one more, if I may. Uh, if there is a team basically working specifically on a project and they have some deliveries and they have a team which is supporting for some sustaining kind of model where they are supporting an existing application mm -hmm. and as well as they are working with new enhancement, new phases and all that. So they have few folks working on development areas, few folks who is supporting an existing application. So mm -hmm. there has to be two models separately or one model will work for that team. So, so the, if, if the Kanban approach to it, the straight Kanban approach to it would be to allocate that as two separate types of services. So one service is delivery of, of enhancements and one service is, is maintenance activity, perhaps bug fixing or, or various minor things. That would be two types of services, potentially with two classes of service. Um, and we would potentially allocate capacity to those streams differently, okay? So that's the actual implementation, whether you partition that out as two teams or whether you have one team and people go across different roles. Kanban doesn't say a lot about how you do that. It's, it says, here's the tool. That's one of the things I think that's a bit of a, uh, a again, a, a difference in the Kanban budget. We are not very prescriptive in anything we say. Right? We, we, don't ha we say, learn your system, and then do, use common sense to figure out how to apply it. Right? So um, I've been in, our, in, in on situations where my teams have had to do that situation where they've had both you know, it's very common. You've got ongoing enhancements you're trying to do as well as maintain existing production. Um, and I've used both models, and both models, it's a matter of figuring out what works for the team. Right? It, and, uh, sometimes you, you want to separate it in order to protect the enhancement activity, so to, you know, to keep the, a, di a, a difference between them. Sometimes that's not the most efficient way. Sometimes it's much better to allow um, the, the experienced people that know how to, you know, the, the people that you want to be able to do some of the complex enhancements are also the people who are really necessary for certain types of maintenance activity. Um, and so it's a matter of figuring out what the business need is, um, what the service need of the business is, and then what's the best way to apply that. Thanks. Hi, Todd. Uh, there was one slide which was mentioning about uh, uh, the circles with uh, the Scrum, Kanban, and... Okay. Yeah. And I want to understand where exactly does uh, Lean fit into that, not this, the one of the starting slides. Yeah, it's early on here. <laughs> Clicking back through it. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah, this, one. this is the yeah. one. So where does lean exactly fit into this? Because here where, it says, okay, this where, is how where actually people see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think lean and uh, I think for the purpose of what we're visualizing, lean, lean is very similar. You could, you could more or less say the lean, lean is this similar circle here. Um, the lean principles are much along the lines of what we're, we're um, applying in Kanban. Uh, lean goes outside of software. I think it's, it's, uh, it's compatible. I think the important thing is it's compatible with the Agile values and the Agile mindset, but it, takes, it ex extends certain pieces of it in a different direction. So can you be more specific? Um, so, it, so, so one of the things is, is the Agile manifesto is manifesto for software, for Agile software. Both Lean and Kanban go well beyond software. Now, some people have taken Scrum and other approaches outside of software. Um, but certainly we have had quite a bit of success in Kanban taking, you know, m many people find Kanban far more, far easier to adapt in, in systems outside of software development. Because iterations, while they work ex reasonably well in, in many, many types of software development, may or may not apply in, in other places. Now there's, you know, so, I, I, but I think it's also some of the values that we're pulling in are coming from slightly different places as well. That's why, why we look at it as, as being beyond. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Todd. Uh, you yeah. talked about the flow of work, but yeah. uh, we often ex we have experienced that uh, during development projects, work is always not flowing. So work, uh, different work packages, packets get blocked at different stages of the project. 
while they are work in progress. So in because, because of several reasons, maybe dependencies among the team, technical blockages, et cetera, et cetera. So in such scenarios, uh, you know, how Kanban will be effective? Yeah, so, so the first thing we want to do, so we, we, have, we have work and we're, we're flowing it. So the first thing we want to look at is why is it blocked? What is it that's causing it blocked? What is it that's causing us to be delayed in our flow of work? So this, the, the Kanban approach that is one is we ask that question all the time. Right? We're continuously asking what's, flow, what's blocking flow, what's keeping this from flowing. If we find that the flow, the dependency or the delay um, is within our control, then we act accordingly. If we find that those, the dependency or delay is outside our control, then we have different set of things we want to do. Right? But the, 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 the approach is always to say, we're going to focus on flow and we're going to keep asking that question until we understand it and we're not going to give up until we understand it and then we're going to go chase it. Right? We're going to keep chasing it. So it's about asking the question and Surface, surfacing it first, asking the question, and then figuring out, as a, as a team, how do we organize ourselves to make sure this happens and gets, and gets uh, dealt with? Um, and then there's you know, some of the tools we also have for visualizing, uh, how, how uh, visualizing dependencies, um, and, and uh, oftentimes people will set up swim lanes to show that something is, is, has dependencies, and that means we manage it in, in a certain way. Um, so it's all about identifying it, and then being able to, from the identification, manage for it appropriately, and not be surprised by it. I mean, that's a, you, Thank you. Uh, uh, oh. The change principles, yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, what we, we, we have some idea of where we may be wanting to head, but we're not, we're not trying to be very predict, pre precise about that, right? Um, but mostly what we're looking for is, it, as we are today, what's the biggest change we could make that would be a small, that gets us somewhere, right? And how do we go, what, what is it that takes us around the, the resistance? So we take small steps in order to both experiment, avoid as much resistance as possible, and get continuous improvement and get continuous learning. So it really is not necessary to have a big picture of where you're trying to get to. It's more just having a commitment to wanting to continuously improve. Okay. And Is avoiding resistance, that's a great question. In fact, that's, the, that's going to be what the keynote at our, our, our North America conference is going to be about, is when, when is avoiding resistance the right answer, and when is, is um, actually moving the resistance the right answer? And I think the, 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 the quick answer to that is most of the time, the avoiding resistance is the expedient and, and best approach. There are some times where you just have to do something um, and, and, and move the resistance eventually in order to get to the right place. So there's some of each. You want to have it, and you want to have it in your toolkit. You want to have in your coaching tool, toolkit uh, the, the tool that helps you go around the rock and the one that helps you at least move the rock around and potentially um, adjust it, right? So the, there are different tools that, that take you to, to each approach. I actually, I have two questions. So first question is more around the unit of work. So when we are in a new, a new team is adopting, let's say, Kanban or Scrum or any other framework, so typically uh, it takes a time for team to understand and split their stories or unit of work in a way that more or less all of them are of similar sizes. So how important is the similarity in sizes important when it comes to Kanban versus if we have a lot of story or unit sizes which are like variety, like, like a huge range? So, so that's a great question. Um, how important is that, that, the, that, the unit of, that the unit of work has the same size? The most important thing in order for the metrics to work out is not so much that the units of, are coming in at the same size as much as that the distribution is, is, the distribution at time one is, or time A is more or less the same as the distribution at time B. 
So if, we have a, if, if our range of stories that we're coming in with are you know, from 1 to 10, and they stay 1 to 10 and more or less the same, then the metrics will work themselves out, it, it, as long as it's a, a, a fairly, um, you know, in that type of range is, is going to be fine. Now, if it's, if it's a huge range, then you have a little bit more, more concern about that. The degree of predictability will always be a little bit better the, the more similar they are, okay? But the, 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 um, we can do a lot with, with, uh, um, with a reasonable range of, of distribution. It does not, you don't have to put, you know, it doesn't have to be um, spending a lot of time to try to make them equally sized or anything like that. Okay, uh, yeah, so oops, just one more. one more question. So this is around the scaled model where we have, let's say, multiple operational services uh, getting hold of, overlapped into, let's say, one service in a scaled model. So how important or what are your uh, thoughts on ma managing the flow? Like what are the best practices around the flow measurement and management in a scale model like this, particularly around the measurement of flow? How do you measure flow when there are multiple different type of services getting aggregated into one? Okay, so multiple services being aggregated into one place, how do you measure flow? So, yeah, so the, there's multiple approaches to that. One is, one is we have the tool of flow, flow efficiency to indicate how, how, our, how efficient is work moving through the system. Um, and so that's, that's an indication of active work versus work that's work in, in, uh, in delay states. Um, so that's at, the, at one service level. When you've got multiple of these things rolling up into one service, you also you have that same behavior, right? It's just it's just at, at one service can be delaying another service, and so you have to look at how much active work is happening to that, and then how is that the big service that you're trying to flow um, being impacted by those different delays? So it's more or less the same the same model, right? You're looking at active work versus um, delay work, and and what does that mean from flow efficiency, um, and and really, with, you know, as long as, I mean, we're seeing, if you're getting flow efficiencies of about 40% or so, that's usually considered not to be your problem. But what we, also, we often see flow efficiencies where there's lots of handoffs uh, down in the well below 10%. And then that's a real, real opportunity for improvement. Yeah, but I don't think it would need to. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be okay. I mean, you're looking at, at, at a high level, and, and you don't want to get too carried away with precision and flow efficiency numbers. You're just looking, mostly what you're looking for in flow efficiency is whether you have a flow efficiency problem or not, because if you don't, if, not having a flow efficiency problem doesn't say you're doing great work. You could have a totally different problem. It just means you don't have a flow efficiency problem. I, I rarely go beyond five, and if let's say there is a team and there has, I mean, there could be some items which are worth eight points. I'm talk, talking about team which is using Kanban for development project, but they are still using you know uh, Scrum related uh, story sizing. I would like to avoid and have the team have a rule that you know eight point stories must be split. As you know, you have they have to have a serious attempt at splitting that thing. Uh, it has a slight impact on the metrics also. Uh, most of the metrics like community flow diagram, run chart, and lead time distribution, they will still work at item level, but I usually do through point, throughput chart based on story points. So just to have a more meaningful you know, data in terms of how many points are getting done per week or per, per month. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's good. I mean, I, I, like I say, said, I think up to one to 10, it's still stable, but I think if you can get it down to one to five, it's going to be more predictable, so a bit more predictable at each, each, each degree. But sometimes you fool yourself if you think, I'm going to make everything the same, because that's, at that point, you're, you're, you're still guessing. So. All right, we can take uh, one last question. 
So in projects like we do PI planning, right? Then we do sprint planning. So we have like better forecast when we do the scrum, right? And how about in Kanban? Like, can we do like uh, predict forecast in when we do the Kanban model? Maybe in three months or so, or it's like only the weekly limit we have to carry it. Yeah. So so the, the the Kanban approach, the main thing we want to try to do is collect as collect data as quickly as possible so that we continually update. The, the more data we have the more accurate our forecasts are going to be. In the early stages, we have no data. It means our forecasts are going to be quite inaccurate. It means we, we're, we're basically using whatever, we're using humans as the means of estimating, and it's going to be very inaccurate. Uh, we just don't have that data. Once we've got, once we've collected data, and we have lead time data, um, we have the ability to do much better forecasting. A lot of the tools I was talking to, uh, Sudi from, from Digite, they just introduced some, some forecasting tools within, within Swift Kanban. Um, and it gives you very good indications as to, you know, you have an 85% chance that, that this item will be delivered within this time. That's the type of approach we take. We collect the data based on the data, then we know what, what our um, probability of, of uh, the forecast being accurate would be. Okay. And so that's what we try to, as, as we increment through, then we'll have a much better understanding and, and uh, be in a much better position to have predictability. But early stages, you're, you're not going to be, I mean, you have no reason to expect high degrees of accuracy in early stages. And, and we just fool ourselves in the past with, with, uh, um, with other approaches. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Very Thanks, good. everyone. Uh, okay. We are running out of time. So, yeah. Okay, very good. Thank Thanks, you very sir. much. <laughs>